welcome to the Functional Medicine Radio Show with your host, Dr. Carrie Drizga, known internationally as the Functional Medicine Doc. Dr. Carrie is committed to helping patients find the root cause of their health problems and fixing the cause with natural treatments so they can feel normal again. Dr. Carey is the founder of Functional Medicine Ontario and is the author of the hit book, Reclaim Your Energy and Feel Normal Again. Please welcome your host, Dr. Carrie Drizga. Hello, everybody, and welcome to the Functional Medicine Radio Show, the only internet radio show dedicated to giving you real solutions to improve your health. Not only are they real solutions, but they are natural solutions as well. Because as you know, the one and only true wealth you have is your health. I'm your host, Dr. Kerry Drizga, the Functional Medicine Doc, and I'm committed to helping you find the root cause of your health problem, fix the cause with natural treatments, so you can feel normal again and live your life to the fullest. Just a quick bit of housekeeping before I introduce today's special guest. I'm happy to announce that I'm now working on my next book. The title is Reclaim Your Energy and Feel Normal Again for Men. I've discovered 14 root causes of fatigue. I like to call them the fatigue factors. And in this book, I'll explain eight of the 14 and how they specifically relate to men. And of course, I'll include my own personal fatigue story, along with four or five other stories from real fatigue cases from my private practice. This book should be ready later this year, so keep an eye out for it. That's it for our housekeeping, so let's get started. I'm very excited about this week's show because my special guest is Dr. Michael Finkelstein. Let me tell you a little bit about him. Training in both conventional medicine and integrative medicine and he is the recipient of numerous distinctions. So drawing from his diverse medical expertise, Dr. Finkelstein offers both a micro point of view and a macro point of view on our healthcare needs and challenges of today. And he provides tried and true solutions for healing individual patients and the medical system as a whole. It's called slow medicine. Uh, Dr. Finkelstein, thank you so much for being my special guest today on this episode of the Functional Medicine Radio Show. Well, thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be with you. So you know and I know that we have so many patients out there, so many people are just struggling with chronic health problems like diabetes and heart disease, different autoimmune diseases, um, arthritis, chronic pain, digestive problems, and they've tried a lot of They've tried a lot of remedies, like they've seen doctors, they've seen specialists, they've tried pills, and they're still suffering. And I know with the patients that come see me, they're just tired of being offered Band-Aid solutions. So can you tell us, is this part of what prompted you to write your book, Slow Medicine? Yes, absolutely. I mean, I started to share that frustration with my patients because my whole approach to the medical profession when I was a young person, you know, set, you know, setting my sights on that as my future was to help people. And after years of practice, though, occasionally the pharmaceutical prescriptions and the referrals to other docs was helping people very often. It really didn't carry people across the line, you know, to that place of functional wholeness and the relief of enough symptoms that they can get back into their lives. And so I was frustrated like they were because I wanted to do better. I realized that the Western medical model is quite limited. You know, it works great for acute life threatening things, but for the chronic condition and even beyond that for helping people just, you know, be happy and functionally healthy, uh, being a member of a community where we support each other you know, Western medical training does not really offer doctors much help with how to be that type of person any longer. I mean, it's, you know, the, the family doc is no longer a neighbor so much. Uh, somebody sharing the same journey with you. It's somebody you go to in a sterile building and you look for quick fixes and that approach wasn't working. So I was motivated to go back to school to study other systems of health and healing so that I could come up with some better ideas and be a better person myself to help people the way I had initially envisioned. So you have a very unique view because you've studied both conventional medicine and integrative medicine. So that's one of the reasons why I ha- wanted to have you on my show today. Mm. And um, I, and I would say, well, at least here in Canada, um, our family doctors, they are 
we have a shortage of family doctors and they don't have a lot of time to spend with each patient. And I know that patients would like to have more time with their doctors. Um, so in your book, Slow Medicine, is that is that part of it so that people can have more time to spend with their doctor, to ask questions, to try and figure things out? Yeah, I think that the you know there's a fundamental problem when we try to do things too quickly, especially when it comes to a complex situation like how we feel and how you know whether or not we're healthy, whether that's in our mind, our body, our communities, all of those things together. You know, it can't be rushed. In fact, our lifetime, you know, let's say we're optimistic is 100 years, that's a lot of time. And so where are we going in an hour or a week even? So when the medical system tries to respond to people's, you know, feeling states of not well to try to do something immediately, it is somewhat of a bait and switch. You know, yes, we want to relieve suffering as fast as possible, but we also now have a huge body of evidence to suggest that it doesn't work that way. And so, yeah, I think there needs to be an appreciation that things take time. And one of the things that take time is that initial evaluation of looking at the pieces of the puzzle and making sure at least the majority, if not all the pieces are examined to really understand what's going on for a person. And for me, that's an inventory of questions that analyze not just the physical body, but the way that physical body interacts with the rest of that person's life, which is what's in their mind, what's in their community, what's in the environment around them, things that affect us all, all the time. So you just uh, touched on your inventory of questions. And I know in your book, Slow Medicine, you outline 77 questions uh, that people should ask themselves um, to to look at different areas of their life uh, about trying to figure out uh, what is their state of health? Where are their health problems really coming from? Can you can you tell our listeners about about that whole process? Yeah, <clears throat> it's you know it started with the questionnaire that I received when I joined the American Holistic Medical Association, and this was maybe 15 years ago. All the physicians and nurse practitioners who came to that initial conference were given a questionnaire written by a friend of mine, a physician named Rav Ifker from Colorado, and. It was 75 questions. It was 25 questions about the physical body, 25 questions about the mental, emotional body, and 25 questions about a spiritual analysis. And it was meant for those people who were in the audience, the the practitioners themselves, to just do an analysis of how they were in their own life. And I found that to be very intriguing. And it helped me understand that there actually is a better definition of health than just what we do when we measure the body itself, by itself. And that is... Again, that functional relationship between the body and the rest of a person's life. You know, a good body works really nicely, but, you know, if you have crappy relationships, then what good is it doing for you? Uh, Similarly, a person can be broken down. You know, we we know many people who are sick who have remarkable relationships and remarkable lives and maybe even get to the end of that life. They're dying or they're days or minutes away from death and they're smiling. They're still able to do that. I've seen that dozens and dozens of times. So what's the difference? I mean, what... Health, then, is a functional state of being. It's not just the numbers. And so I adopted that questionnaire that I originally received and use that now as a tool explicitly to help people evaluate where they are in terms of this more holistic assessment of health. It's sort of like doing a jigsaw puzzle. Imagine if you kept half the pieces in the box. How far would you get? You know, you might wind up with a couple of nice edges and corners and maybe a little bit of a flower in the middle, but you would never complete the picture. So the first step to any puzzle solution is to get all the pieces out of the box and flip them over and then come up with some sort of practical plan to piece them together. And the practical plan, actually, and this works in an analogy for my work, is you start with the easy stuff. You get the edges and the corners arranged. And in the process of looking at that for a while, you then start seeing pieces in the middle fitting together. And eventually, one after another, you do that. So the 77 questions, it's an arbitrary number but it covers a good spectrum of what I would say is health uh, or matters to health or the facets of our health. And when you look at them and you assess how you're doing in each of them, you see where there are opportunities and you start building back the full picture. So in your book, um, you talk about health. So I'm not sure if this was your definition of health, but in your book you wrote, health is a natural state of wholeness 
marked by the establishment of dynamic balance, encompassing and fully integrating the areas of our mental, emotional, physical, spiritual, social, and environmental condition. Yeah, I wrote that. <laughs> and, you know, there are many, <laughs> I love it. I love it. <laughs> there are many people who've written great, you know, you know, sort of statements with regard to what does health look like. I think every single person knows what it feels like. Mm-hmm. You know, I'm, I'm able to do enough. I'm able to move. I'm able to engage enough with the things that matter to me that I feel connected. I feel like I'm moving in a direction of greater, uh, you know, sort of value and vitality and meaning. It doesn't mean I live forever. It doesn't mean I never get an ailment. It doesn't mean I don't have to see doctors and, and therapists. It means I can function well enough to live my life. And that's what that definition is trying to establish. Yeah, I love that definition. And I think a lot of people don't really think beyond, well, health is just I feel good. And so I think your definition is very all-encompassing. And I think even for doctors, we have to be reminded, even I need to be reminded, that health encompasses all these different areas as well. Yeah, you know, I think... People often ask me, so what's the first question? And you have 77 questions. Is there one that's more important than the other? Or what do you ask first? And I do ask a first question. And that first question gets to what you just alluded to, which is this, you know, functional state of being. And the question is this. Let's say I was a magician. You know, you came to me and you really, you know, came to the right person because I have this wand and I can wave it and I can get rid of all your ailments. The question I'm going to still ask you is now what are you going to do with your life? Because without clearly understanding why you want to be healthy unconsciously the body doesn't necessarily follow when there's no coherence you know our cells are driven by not just our thoughts but they're driven by maybe a more existential spiritual longing for something greater meaning of our lives and that needs to be connected in this process and so it's a question that i ask people to reflect on because you want to know why you're going to run the marathon you know, what are you going to get at the end? Is it just a pat on the back and satisfaction, a medal on your wall? Or do you want something of greater value, which is often gets us back to the subject of relationships with each other, with the planet, with our, the divine, and ultimately with ourselves? I think that's an excellent place to start because people then really start thinking about the big picture, their big why, as to why they want to go through this journey. Because like you said, it's a puzzle. It takes time to figure out why people have diabetes, why they have autoimmune diseases, why they have chronic pain, all of those kind of chronic conditions. It's a real puzzle and it takes time to figure out. And the patient needs to be ready to go for that marathon run because, um, you know, quitting, you know, uh, let's say quitting 10 meters out of the gate or 100 meters out of the gate is just, it's frustrating for us doctors because we, you know, we we're there that we're there to help them make it all the way to the, the finish line. And it's important, though, I think, as doctors to help people explore, ultimately answer for themselves, where is the finish line? Mm, the finish yes. line isn't just get my blood sugar to be normal. That's not the finish line. That's a intermediary point. And in fact, you could probably get to the finish line with your blood sugar not being normal. So I think sometimes we get lost in the details, especially around the uh-huh. details of the physical body and how it functions, as important as that is, because you can't do it without some attention to those details. But we get lost in the pursuit of resolving all those different ailments and forgetting where the finish line is. Even, again, if doctors were so powerful, therapists were so powerful, they can get rid of all the ailments. What's that person going to do? What are they going to say on their deathbed about the value and the meaning of their life? Who is helping them with that? And I believe that is a role for physicians and other practitioners of health and healing. Because I think that is ultimately, when we get to the question of why do we even suffer to begin with, it's not just because we smoke and we drink and we don't eat well and we don't exercise. It's because there's some something that happens to us when we're suffering, we get very creative. And in that creativity, we build a better universe. It's sort of remarkable. And it's, I think 
there's a really important role we each play in addressing, when we're addressing our symptoms, to contribute to this whole vast project that humanity is. So in your book, again, you outlined 77 key questions. And one of the things that I really loved about your book is you, you go through each question one by one, and you kind of give a definition by what you mean by that question and some examples um, to really uh, pique a person's um, curiosity to really, for them to look deep inside as to what is the answer for that question for them. And, uh, and again, you kind of cover four key categories. You cover self and relationships and nature, and then number four you call is beyond. So, mm. so can you give us a few examples of questions that would be like in the self category? Yeah, you know, let me just first say that what I really try to depict, at least in my way of thinking about it, and I'm, what I'm offering people is that there's a wheel of health. You know, when all these things work together, sort of like a bicycle wheel, you know, that it rolls and it moves the vehicle. Um, in my wheel of health idea, there are seven spokes. You mentioned four of them. Four of them are relationships that I'll, I'll get back to and answer your question. But mm -hmm. there are the other three, which is the physical body itself, the mental emotional body, and community, you know, our working relationship with each other. But then there are four relationships. And it very much does start with self. In other words, how do you feel about yourself? Um, do you spend enough time taking care of yourself? And one of those questions then is, do you take a day off every week? Whether you call it a Sabbath or not, whether it's a divine you know, devotional practice or whether it's one where you just restore yourself, your own you know, recharging of batteries that's required, or do you rush, rush, rush through your life and your name doesn't appear in your own calendar? The, you know, that's sort of a fundamental question. How do you feel about, you know, how you look? Are you aware of life force energy within you? You know, these are ways that people can assess, gee, do I feel alive or not? Of course, all these things relate to the others. You know, it's very hard mm -hmm. to separate mm -hmm. them completely. You know, so that's another one of my points, which is that these things are all interrelated. We can only for the moment break them apart, but in truth, our state of being is these things all happening at the same time. So the questions aren't meant to be, you're just going to work on your physical body on Monday and your mental, emotional body on Tuesday and yourself on Saturday. Um, it's really about understanding how these things are just constantly rolling around with each other and they're sh you know, shifting and they're, some may be more or less of a priority in the moment. So the idea is to, and that's why there's a book written around this, is to explore the nature of each of these with a few paragraphs and ideas to get people to start seeing this really full picture and I would say make it fun. This is not a, this is not a set of 77 chores to do or new projects. This is about how you see how exciting it is that all these things are related and each of us has an opportunity to sort of make significant strides in the direction of improving the functional relationship between them. So, Dr. Finkelstein, how do you see people using your book, or or how do you recommend they use your book? Well, so it's it's sort of like doing that a jigsaw puzzle. The first thing I offer is, you know, take the inventory of questions yourself, like on day one. It's in the appendix. It's in the back. Seventy-seven questions, and they're they're you know the idea is to rank them. You know how strong you are in each of them. So let's say it is about, you know, are you close to your ideal body weight? Well, you know, first, everyone has to subjectively understand what that means, and, and I'm not looking to grade this. So let's say you think you are, and so in the one to five, you would say I'm a four. I'm not exactly there, but I'm very close. But in another question, do you um, feel close to your parents? You may say, no, I don't. I actually, you know, have a lot of resentment. There's a lot of history, and you may put a one there. And so you take this initial inventory. Then I ask you then to start reading the book, and the book's written around themes, like there'll be a theme about the meaning of your life, or you know, in other words, if this was the last day of your life, what would you do? That's actually, books are written on that same subject, but that's one of the chapters, or you know, tell me about your relationships and community, and then the questions are bunched together in that chapter that seem related to that to me, and then you read about it, and while you're reading the book, I'm asking you all along to look at the things that seem to be the easiest for you to make a move. So let's say 
you know, your relationship with your parents is, is a one, but you realize if you wrote a letter to them and expressed yourself, you might make it a two. You know, a little less resentment, a little less bottled up, or you release anger a little bit, or you spend time playing on Saturdays, and you can take that question and you can improve it. And you see where there's the low-hanging fruit, I'd call it, the easy stuff. And you do that. You make a plan for yourself, like in the next week or month. All right, I'm going to do the easiest things first. I'm going to do the edges of this puzzle. Um, then you take the inventory again. Now you see where the twos and threes are, your opportunities, and you read those areas of the book where those come up, and you say, gee, I guess I could now maybe you know, walk through the woods once a week, you know, and be, feel more connected to nature, or I can go to a farmer's market and buy some food. Um, you see how there are these things, and over time, this is sort of like a blueprint for health. Six months later, I think people feel remarkably better, not because they've targeted a particular ailment or symptom, but because they're promoting the innate healing response because by pulling this all together all of a sudden they get stronger and stronger and stronger the picture becomes more complete of course there may be those things that linger that are very challenging and there may be health things that are going on that are very challenging well those deserve special focus and attention often complementary therapies meaning treatments and assessments by other practitioners but it's not one or the other I sort of look at people and sort of before you put the seeds of, let's say, acupuncture into the soil, you take care of the soil. And my book is about taking care of the soil. Wow, I love that analogy. I love it, taking care of the soil. And your questions in your book, they are just so powerful. And I can easily see how, as a person just works their way through that book, it just can totally transform their life. Not just transform their health, but just transform their life, which is really why you wrote it. Yeah, and I think more important than being, you know, sort of medically healthy mm -hmm. is having a really good quality life. And so the two are not mutually exclusive, of course, but often we get lost in the medical. We get lost in the diagnosis. We get lost in the symptom, and we lose track of our life. And there are things we can do with our life, and the fact it's very healing to get back on track of the relationships that matter to us. Um, to you know, to empty the garbage once in a while. Meaning, write, journal, get rid of some of the emotional stuff that's sort of stuck inside. These are the ways that we actually, along the way, not only feel better, but we actually can start resolving some of the body issues. Um, and so that's my intention. Yeah, to help people, you know, no matter how long their life is, um, find joy more immediately satisfaction and feel hopeful that they're on that track and that's why the subtitle hope and healing for chronic illness was written that way because in such a process i believe hope is restored so dr finkelstein we're starting to run low on time how can our listeners find out more about you and how can they get their hands on your book because i bet a lot of people right now are just salivating and they want to find your book asap well so the book can be found wherever books are found you know Amazon and Barnes and Nobles and all carry the books. Uh, my website, you can click the link on my website, which is slowmedicinedoctor.com, and doctor is spelled out, D-O-C-T-O-R, so slowmedicinedoctor.com. And on that website is a lot of information about my my own life, where I live on a small working farm out, you know, 50 miles from New York City, um, and the type of environment that I cultivate here, which I hope shows people what it looks like and feels like to, to be in the state of balance and uh, I invite people to join me, you know, if they're in the neighborhood or connect with me via, you know, my blog, you know, which I often write in Huffington Post and are all posted on that website. So the website is definitely by far the, the resource for all this information. Okay, so for the listeners out there that are in their car right now driving or you're on your bike or you're jogging, I'll make sure that those links that Dr. Finkelstein just mentioned are in the podcast notes so that you can easily find his website and his book. Dr. Finkelstein, thank you so much for being my special guest today. This has just been an awesome interview. Well, I appreciate the time and, and I wish you well, of course, and success in your endeavor, which is to help people. I think that's more that we can do together. The more this troubled universe, you know, or at least our planet, will move in the direction of peace and harmony. I think that's what we all look for. That ultimately would be the highest definition of health. Yeah. Amen to that. Mm. 
All right, that wraps up this very special episode of the Functional Medicine Radio Show with Dr. Michael Finkelstein. And I want to thank you, our listeners, for tuning in today. And I'd like to invite you back next week for another episode of the Functional Medicine Radio Show. As always, I'm your host, Dr. Carrie Drizga, the Functional Medicine Doc. Have a great week, everyone. You've been listening to the Functional Medicine Radio Show with your host, Dr. Carrie Drizga, known internationally as the Functional Medicine Doc. Dr. Carey is committed to helping patients find the root cause of their health problems and fixing the cause with natural treatments so they can feel normal again. Dr. Carey is the founder of Functional Medicine Ontario and is the author of the hit book, Reclaim Your Energy and Feel Normal Again. Please tell your friends about the Functional Medicine Radio Show, and we'll see you next week with more from Dr. Carey.